Hello, Hello and, welcome and welcome to the, to the Doof, Doof Book Club, Club our, our monthly, monthly live stream discussion, discussion of, a of a book chosen by you, our listeners. And then joined always by my fishing buddy, Scott Daly. How are you doing, <laughs> Scott? Ready? How, how are the, how are the uh, bass um, jumping today? Well, the weirdest thing happened. Um, it had the face and the skull of a human. So a uh, largemouth bass. Yeah, there you go. Okay. That's uh, very clever. I had trouble visualizing what the human skull fish looked like, actually. It, it looked like a xenomorph. <laughs> My head made it the xenomorph from Alien Resurrection, the one that was like the hybrid. That's what my head I, did. That's what's so funny is that's exactly what my brain did, except I didn't realize that's what it was until you said that. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> Hello, everyone. How's it going? Welcome. I hope you're all having a wonderful Friday evening. It's the weekend after the first week after a holiday, which is a long week. It was for me. It was a long week. I don't know about you guys. So I'm ready ready to chill and hang out and talk about books for a little bit. Um, I'm sure we know a lot of folks. We see some people. I see some people saying hello right now that I recognize. Uh, if you're new here, if you just stumbled upon us, welcome. Uh, we are Doof Media, and we make podcasts all about the stories we love. We also arrange and organize this here monthly book club. Matt, please explain for the 59th time what a book club is. <laughs> Well, this particular book club is one in which Scott and I select five books from among a pool submitted to us by our wonderful Doof community. We then put up a poll over on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash media, for our supporters to vote on which book they'd like us to talk about. The book with the most votes wins, and then we all read it, and we do a book club about it. And then we meet on the last Friday of the month, or in the case of holidays, the first Friday of the next month and chat about it for an hour or so. Um, before we get into this month's book, though, of course, we have to say hello. I see a, a new face, uh, Evil's Comics, uh, saying there's their new sub here, first time listening to Book Club, listening to Kingslinger. So great to see you. I see David. I see uh, Hello Heller. I see Jace. I see Chris. Lots of lots of old names I recognize as well. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, and let's do the part where we vote on next month's book. So for those of you that don't know, we, Matt just said people vote for the book on Patreon. But we also have a little bit of a bonus vote for those of you that come here live. So we allow you to uh, to vote, uh, if you're a patron, to vote twice. Or if you're not a patron, to, to get to vote, to have a say. So uh, I have just posted a straw poll in the chat right there. Uh, for some reason, it's on my my name, not the Doof Media name. I don't know why. But uh, there's a, a link right there. And, uh, and we'll leave that open for the entire show. We'll add those votes to the votes on Patreon. And that's how we will determine what book we will be covering next month uh it's a it's a close it's a close race right now matt it's really close between a few books some of them i was a little surprised about um but uh it's anybody's game right now so um all right let's get into it let's talk about the book that was chosen for the month did, did, did it not go through i don't understand why this is happening i think because i'm on me youtube blocked link mm, pushing yeah probably um this is let's see if i can do something about that i'm going to now in the well i didn't want to do that i just i just logged out um okay uh, so in the middle of streaming to this youtube channel i'm going to attempt to switch why don't you just send me the link and i'll post it as our account how about that that uh is a good plan Okay. We cannot get through this freaking thing. The last two months in a row, we've had all kinds of technical problems. Uh, yeah. Here you go, Matt. Everything has gotten worse. Oh, my God. There we go. There's the straw poll for Matt. Matt is going to share that in the chat as soon as he can. Uh, as always, we allow you two books uh, to choose. You can pick two entries. Um so yeah, let us know what you think and we'll add those votes votes at the end of the episode and then we'll figure out what we're doing for December. But let's talk about November 1st. Matt, what book was selected for November? The book selected for November was The Fisherman by John Langan. And the summary of that book is as follows. In upstate New York, in the woods around Woodstock, Dutchman's Creek flows out of the Asher, Asher Khan... Ashokan Reservoir. Steep banked, fast moving, it offers the promise of fine fishing and of something more, a possibility too fantastic to be true. 
When Abe and Dan, two widowers who have found solace in each other's company and a shared passion for fishing, hear rumors of the creek and what might be found there, the remedy to both their losses, they dismiss it as just another fish story. Soon, though, the men find themselves drawn into the, the, a tale as deep and old as the reservoir. It's a tale of dark pacts, of long-buried secrets, and of a mysterious figure known as Der Fischer, the fisherman. It will bring Abe and Dan face to face with all that they have lost and with the price they must pay to regain it. Fascinating. All right, Matt, uh, you got to tell me what you thought of The Fisherman. I, I have a feeling you enjoyed this one. And uh, while Matt is telling telling us what he thinks, I want you folks listening at home to also tell us what you thought of The Fisherman. Had you read this book before the book club? And uh, and what did you think about it? Matt, go ahead. Uh, no surprises for me. This is one of those books where pretty much as soon as I started it, I had finished um, because <laughs> I just blew through it in like two days. It helps Maybe. that it's pretty short. It is pretty short. It's it's. Uh, I did the audiobook, of course, and the audiobook reader is um, it, it's it's great. Like it's one of those books that really lends itself to being an audiobook because it's a guy telling a story about a thing that happened to him, mm-hmm. which means the audiobook reader can can sort of tell it as if he's acting it. You know, he's performing it, um, and uh, it really it really reels you in. No pun intended, or may, maybe a little bit intended. Um, just a delightful and and I love this kind of story too. I love the kind mm-hmm. of this flavor of of horror and and the unknown and kind of weirdness where it's very Lovecraftian, but we yeah. never you know we we don't get too much information. Sort of just sort of just all of the check boxes that I like in in horror and and um, this kind of thing in general. So yeah, that's that's it for me. Um, excited to talk about it. What do you think? Yeah, um, I can't remember where I heard of the story before. I think, you know, one of the benefits of being a a fan of Stephen King is you tend to follow him on Twitter. And he, not (laughs) on top of posting a lot about his frustrations with with (laughs) politics of our day, um, also, like, posts horror book recommendations. He, like, kind of constantly. Like, he, he recognizes his power and his ability to put his name towards other other authors and he uses that frequently um Uh and i think i'm pretty sure this was one of the ones that i had like just seen that i just kind of mentally clocked oh stephen king likes this book okay um and then did nothing with and then it showed up in our nominations at one point and i was like yes immediately i I recognize this as a a king thing and uh and want to want to dive into it and was so happy to see it win and yeah i i'm i'm definitely with you on this i i really enjoyed this thing i think it is exactly like I, I think it the the quote on the book by by Paul Tremblay, another great horror author, calls it literary horror. And I like that phrase um, in that, you know, this is not pulpy. Um, this is this is kind of it's not it's not even that like scary. It's it's like this this slow burn kind of mood tale that just makes you uncomfortable and, and, and forces you to think about things that are not fun to think about, which is what would I do if I lost my entire family in a horrible car crash? It's it's very fitting that we um, watched Pet Cemetery on another show in the same month that we read this book, because both of those stories are like, well, what would you do if the the worst possible thing happened to you? Um, I I, I love I love that kind of stuff, and I love the way it kind of slow rolls it, and and the the kind of the choice to basically have a book center in the middle of this book there's a whole nother story that is in the middle of this book that i i found as kind of equally fascinating as the the bookends of the the modern day story as well um no it was just a real it was a real pleasure to read it was one of those books i i I only finished it today and that's that's not because i wasn't enjoying it i was just kind of taking my time with it and and reading a few pages at a time and so i I kind of had an opposite experience from you where i just Mm. i didn't rush through it but i was i was not like i never wasn't enjoying it but i was like yeah i'm gonna read 10 pages here 30 pages there and just kind of enjoy my time with it and uh and i really did that's great to hear um uh heller says that uh they were they were a little thrown off by the story within a story, but then they really really dug it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think I felt similarly actually. I was really into the framing story of our um, our two our two fishermen, our two widowers, and it took on a very different tone when we, when we go into the story within a story. But it did grow on me pretty quickly. Um, I did think it was so. So this is how you know when something's working on you is when they throw in a conceit where 
you're inclined, you're, you, you feel like if you weren't really digging the book, you'd be like, oh, come on, man. Um, and what I'm referring to is the, the idea that the guy tells him the story about Fisherman's Creek. And then he's like, surely he didn't talk for more than like an hour. But then I wrote out like, you know, a hundred pages uh, and with all these details that he couldn't have possibly actually said to me. So yeah. I just, I just somehow knew the story magically. And you're like, okay, I get, you know, you have to fit, you have to, it, it's, it's, it's a conceit and it's, and it's like, I don't, fundamentally, I don't care. And it's not a, it's not a criticism because it's executed well and, and you, you enjoy it and you're like, good, you know, good. You, you, you did it. It's, it's fine. Um, I just thought it was kind of funny how you can get away with a lot more when you're actually uh, entertaining me. <laughs> <laughs> No, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree in that, like, I was I was really, really vibing with and this might have been the reason why it took me a little longer to read as well. I was really vibing with the the main story with Abe and I was really into what he was doing, what he was exploring. And, and like the it really sets up this really tantalizing idea of like and everything changed that day we went out to Dutchman's Creek and I'm like, hell yeah, I can't, I can't wait. I can't wait. And then, yeah, we cut back to the story and I did that thing where sometimes you shouldn't do this with a book, but I did the thing when we got to the part two, that was clearly the story within the story. I stopped reading and then like flipped my book until we got out of part two, just to mm -hmm. see how long it was. And I was like, Oh, this is like the whole book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and so there was a, a brief moment there where I was a little bummed about that because I hadn't connected to any of these characters yet. And I was really into Abe and what he was going through. And I wanted, I wanted to be there. I wanted to be there. Um, and it was a little disappointing that we couldn't be. But then slowly but surely that story sucks you in. There's a lot of really interesting things he does structurally. Like the, the, he, he introduces this idea with the, the, the father. Um, like he was some incredibly smart and effective uh professor back home and then like he lost it and, and like the, the book just kind of drops that for you is like that there's some ongoing mystery as to why he suddenly just became like the the uh, uh completely ostracized person mm -hmm. and, and and like it it doesn't answer that for so long and it kind of like you understand why before it actually like technically lays out the answer like the story for you like before he tells the story to jacob um you've kind of already connected the dots of why he got kicked out of uh, the university he was working at because it's all the stuff he's messing with but like it just holds on to that for so long it doesn't even really set it up as a mystery it just says oh yeah by the way um now he's just a stonemason and that's it like it's yeah. what a fascinating character this guy is actually i really enjoyed the I guess humor here and there where, where it's like, yeah, he just, uh, he said he was a stonemason and then he just kind of convinced people he was a stonemason and then he learned it on the job basically. Um, which mm -hmm. I, I, not only is it funny, but I think it's, it says a lot about the character that he was able to, to pull that off successfully. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of great characters. What's funny is I don't remember anybody's name because I read it at the beginning of the month, but <laughs> But there, there are so many great characters, and they really did sit with me, you know, vividly. Um, I, I really, like you said, I really enjoyed the father, you know, um, just just all, all these all these different um, immigrant families in the in the town, and uh, yeah, there's there's almost like a there's like tiers of story within a story, almost because we also have the story of like the guy, the the you know the wealthy guy, the the wealthy guy who has the house mm -hmm. built. Yep. And um, and then his his beloved dies, and then he, I guess, gets the fisherman to come and um, bring her back. It's all very, it's all it's all unclear, which is delightful. I, I like it being unclear. Oh, um, that, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like the the thing that I love most about this is there's no like there's real no world building. <laughs> yeah, which is a funny thing to say that I like that it doesn't have world building, but it's just like. I don't know what does any of this mean like n nothing nothing is kind of resolved in the story like that this great powerful evil is still out there just hovering on the edges it doesn't get defeated it just gets delayed and and even in the present like delayed for how long it seems like the fisherman is gathering forces and and they're starting to leak out um but like that's a, like that's that's so fun like I, I like that it's it's not a 
I was worried as we moved into the into the, the modern day story. I was worried that this was going to be Abe was going to encounter the fisherman again and like be put in charge of being the one that drives him back once again you know mm-hmm. like like and, and that's the thing i didn't want of like i didn't want this this unknowable giant beast and the fishermen themselves explained more i didn't want them to defeat the evil and want that to happen and that's exactly how it plays out is like nothing nothing is resolved there except kind of internally um inside him and, and the, the thing that he's dealing with which is the loss of his wife um and i i yeah i, I appreciated that so much that it, that's the tri- kind of book it was trying to be I definitely had that feeling as the book was wrapping up and I was I was like, we don't have a lot of time left to kind of <laughs> resolve some of these things. And then just the last line of the book is just such a it's just such a delightful horror <laughs> stinger. Yeah. Where you're like, oh, I get it. I get what kind of book this is. Like it, re- it almost recontextualizes the whole book where you're like, oh, this is not a happy story. No, no. This is not a story about how a man. This is not a story about how a man overcame grief. <laughs> this is a story about um, a bunch of really sad people getting sucked down into yeah. the the depths. Um, no, grief is a giant monster in the ocean of blackness, and you can't ever really get rid of it. Mm-hmm. It's always going to be there. You're never free of it. Chained, yeah. chained to you. Yeah. They, that that last line is such a fucking great one. I just I looked it up again while you were talking just to to reintroduce myself to it. They had I thought my mother's nose. It's such it's so, it's so good because like the whole like the you know how this is literature. You know our code for how this is literature. Creepy yep. creepy sex. Yeah, um, weird sex stuff. Yeah, yeah, weird sex stuff happens. So, uh, and, and like the whole time you're thinking like. This can't be good. Like, like uh-huh. what? Like, the one thing you know is that he's not going to die, right? Because mm-hmm. like the the conceit of the thing is he's telling the story after it happened, so you know he's not going to die. But like, he's having sex with this fish lady that's mm-hmm. looking like his wife, and it's like, uh, <laughs> something something bad's going to happen here. And then yeah. uh, the chill, the children, the children, and they are his children, mm-hmm. which. Which is so. It, it's one of those things where it, it makes you think. It makes you think for a while, and and then. Sort of, I think, like with um, the the film uh, uh, Us, you just kind of eventually are like, ah, I'm not gonna really understand it, am I? And you just you just get over it. But like the 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 thing I'm the thing I mean is like, at first you think, oh, everyone, all of these creatures are um, just the dead. They're the souls of the dead. Mm-hmm. And then you realize, like, well, it can't be that simple, really, because they they're clearly also these fish creatures that are taking the forms of living people. Yeah. And they're also capable of having children who are not reflections of any living human. Right. Um, presumably. So, um, it's not quite as clean cut as all that. And then you're, and then you're left just like, Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's some weird, unknowable Lovecraftian thing. Um, I mean, so just parenthetically there, like, I, I thought it was interesting how, you know, the woman who's pretending to, the, the fish thing that's pretending to be his wife is, like, sort of helping him, actually, and, like, successfully guides him to where Dan is and then kind of allows him to leave. And I was like, well, I guess, I guess maybe one of them was, like, good, actually, you know? Maybe they're not all evil. And then you, and then I think... In the end, I just concluded like, well, she, she got, she got what she wanted from him, so it was fine. <laughs> like she's, it, it's not that she cared about him specifically, or maybe she did. And I, and I love that I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, sure. I, I don't know if I read that as like her helping him. I thought it was like, well, so, so are the fish people a reflection of the fishermen or of the fish? Right, I, and I think it's the the latter, right? Um, <laughs> I don't know if this matters, actually. I think, I mean, it, it, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, actually. Um, I mean, I got the impression that they were taking on the form of, of whatever person was going to lure the fishermen into the water and then they were going to, you know, do whatever they wanted, maybe eat them or whatever, mm-hmm. or maybe mate with them or, or whatever, whatever. They're, they're fish monsters. They don't. Their, their motivations are not clear. Um, <laughs> and also their like relationship with the fishermen isn't clear. Like, are they, are they all his thralls or 
Are they just kind of doing their own thing? Yeah. Like yeah. The, the the bit where like we see the fisherman, we see a guy who looks like the fisherman walking around. That was and, so weird. And that... and then she like yells at him. Yeah. And then we come upon him and he's been chained to a rock for ten thousand years. And you're yeah. like, okay. That's that's cool. the one. That's the one. And and Heller is talking about this in chat right now as well. Like that's the one part of the book that I was like, I don't understand. Even after finishing, I don't understand what we're doing here. I mean, my best guess was like time is all. Like we we kind of know definitively that time is is different and, and all relative here, right? Because Dan is there for days or, mm-hmm. or hours. He says, um, whereas whereas Abe just got there. Mm-hmm. So like maybe this is like an earlier version of the guest. Um, who is the fisherman mm-hmm. like the, the first time he stumbled into this place and he's told or maybe I, I don't I don't I don't know I don't know yeah, yeah I, I think you're I think you're right I mean I, I think the domain within the fisherman dimension basically follows dream logic and is, mm-hmm. is meant to be in, impenetrable which yeah. again is what I like just pretend like it's Mulholland Drive I, and, I was uh, just thinking and I was just thinking. yeah yeah um Speaking of like, uh, th- there's there's so many. So obviously, the overarching thing is is grief, right? And like the the connecting tissue to all these stories is these are all men who have lost uh, their spouse and in, in some cases uh, children as well. Um, and uh, like, it's po- powerful, powerful thing <laughs> for for us us men out here that like I just couldn't imagine going through that like you know we talked about pet cemetery last week um and and i basically said i basically declared that if such a thing existed and my son died i would 100 percent bury my child in the cemetery right away because i wanted them back and this 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 makes you ask the question right it's like would you would you take the deal that dan takes here like obviously he's delusional and 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 gets eaten for it um but but would you would you want to take the deal? Like, the, the, basically, the thing he does is like, if you learn, if if you Matt like lose your spouse, let's say, and you learn that hey, if you go up to this creek, you might see them, and then on your way there, some guy tells you a story about how yeah, you're definitely gonna see them, but also there's a giant scary fish monster that is trying to that if if captured and contained by this person will destroy the world possibly. Um, would you still? Would you still go up to the creek? <laughs> um, I mean, it, 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 if you're in the situation and the mental state that I think Dan is at the time, I think I think it's believable that he would, right? Mm-hmm. If, if you're that grief stricken, if you're that desperate to just see them again. Um, also, I think it's chronologically wise. It's it's kind of funny because nothing in the you know story of, of the past really suggests that these creatures are anything other than like the dead mm-hmm. it's it's not until abe has sex with one of them that he realizes that that it's almost certainly not actually just like his wife in fish form it's probably entirely some other creature who's just sort of reflecting his memories um of her or at least that's the impression i got and you know, it's debatable whether Dan ever really acknowledges that that's the case, because I think he's he's just in a state of willful disbelief, and he's like, "I've got my family, they're they're all here," and he's just ignoring all the indications that they're obviously not actually his family. Um, so yeah, so, I think I, I think much like um, Pet Cemetery, I think you would convince yourself that it was all cool, um, and you could totally stay next to the infinite ocean of of blackness, next to the eldritch beast. Do you think John? I was trying to look this up while you were talking, and I was like, I feel like John Langan must have lost a spouse. Like, I just feel like the way he writes about that kind of loss is so specific, especially through the, the lens of Abe. Like, it's so specific and acute in in the the feelings of grief and that specific kind of loss that I can't help but feel like he must have gone through that or, or something similar. Um, but I have no idea. I don't know. No idea. Maybe he's just uh, good at uh, fiction writing. I don't know. I mean, sure, probably. Like, yes. The the, the counter argument to that is, well, yeah. Also, it's a story, and uh, people are good at making those up, and they don't have to have lived it without doing it. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like when he's talking about like the stuff that really got me in the early part of the book, and, and kind of what what hooked me to this whole thing was like the specificity of like 
yeah, the first year is actually not so bad. It's the second year that really mm-hmm. gets you and, and going into the details of that. And it's just like that felt that felt so real to me. And mm-hmm. I was just like, wow, how do you capture that that feeling? I don't know. Yeah. It's just it, it left me going like you must have experienced something like this. Yeah, maybe he knew someone, someone close to him went through something yeah. like that or yeah. something. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I agree. I mean, I did. I didn't have the thought that you just said of like, oh, he must have experienced this. But I did have the feeling of like, this is what I love about writing is I I never would have thought like, oh, the second year is the hardest. That's not something that's not a thought I ever would have had. I've never been through something like this. Mm -hmm. But once you read that from that character's point of view, you're like, that makes sense. That that's probably true. For all I know, that's true. Yeah. Um, What? So uh, fishing, fishing as a, a metaphor here. I mean, so mm-hmm. there, there, there's a lot, there's a lot going on with fishing in this book called the fisherman, right? Um, uh, the, f- f- the fisher, the fisher of men. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, I, one thing I was trying to get my head around was G- Abe feels this strong urge to go fishing, right? Like something that almost comes externally to him. Mm-hmm. And he says it was from his wife who he, he, when he went out there would like feel at times. Is any of this in your mind in the logic of the book, actually his wife? <laughs> or like, like doing like, is any of this speaking of some sort of life after death that is reflecting in, in the spirit of his <clears throat> wife, encouraging him and, and try, or is this all the machinations of this, this evil um, that is pushing people towards uh, towards doing what it wants in essence, like the, the, the giant whale that is grief. Yeah. I'm glad you framed it that way. I mean, it's possible that it's even worse than all of that. And this is an accurate representation of the afterlife. And like the afterlife is, is you end up sort of just becoming part of this horrible, this, this like, you become a floating corpse basically in this infinite black ocean where you're just tormented with, um, the worst aspects of yourself forever. And there's no heaven or hell. There's just this for everyone. Um, and, and so when you say is, is his wife actually beckoning him and, and is it his real wife? The answer could be yes, but that's the horror of it actually <laughs> um, like that. Cause this is a thought I, I legitimately had while I was reading it is I was like, Oh, this is, this is a, this is what he's saying. The afterlife is like, this is mm. the, this is the true horror is like you, everyone has this awful nightmarish eternal existence in the fisherman dimension uh, when they die. And that's, um, that's that's pretty harsh. That's some good horror right there. I like that. Yeah, no, I like that a lot. I I think I like that. And that like one of the things I was doing because obviously I had Pet Cemetery on the brain and was thinking a lot as as always uh, we do uh, Stephen King and I was thinking about the difference between this story and and the way I think King would write a story like this. And I think the big difference to me is that you know a King story even even in a the darkest possible version of of a Stephen King horror story there is always this kind of battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil that the world has evil like this. The world has unexplainable, unknowable, horrific evil that exists, but it, it, it always has the other side of that coin. There is, there is forces of good working and pushing and prodding and, and moving people into positions to combat that evil. Um, I don't think that exists in this story. Like I, and that, that that's kind of why I posed the question to you that way, because I don't think it is. I think you're spot on. I don't think there's, there's just, there's just this, there's just mm-hmm. this. And it, it is in essence, a metaphor for the, the overwhelming pull of grief, like a, like a lure in your mouth. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, there's, there's no, <laughs> there's no sunny side. There's no good side. There's, I mean, and like, the the thing that i love about it is you can go years decades and 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 feel like you're getting better and then the second that lure drops in your pool the second you see that person the second you're reconnected to that thing you just grab it you just grab it like immediately like like the, one of my favorite parts of the book is he sees marie and he's just gone mm-hmm. like 
it, it, like the story like i love <laughs> i actually love so much he's like he's following her and he's going and he sees this 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 giant black ocean and this huge beast and like nowhere in any of this part is he like man this is a lot like that story i just heard until like the very end where he goes now you're i've been thinking about the story this whole time and i was like mm-hmm. well none of your writing <laughs> suggests you were and i think that's just because i think in the in the in the very moment i think when he looks back reflexively on it he's like yeah i was probably like mentally comparing it to the story i just wasn't but I, th- I think in the moment he was just with her there mm-hmm. um and nothing else nothing else and the just like the power that that grief has i, I think the the kind of little monologue in there about how um you know the like the the hardest thing it could be possible for a person to do is mentally allow oneself to file their loved one as gone and mm-hmm. then suddenly be put put face to face with with that person is not like the the joy there but also just the mental anguish of you already started to process that and then it comes back and how like that that it doesn't in in reality it doesn't have to be like the physical person there it could just be like a memory or or, or an unexpected thing that pops up um that reminds you of them or puts you in a place or something like that and it's just it's just there it's just giant fish hooks wrapped around giant trees holding you in place forever <laughs> mm-hmm. and the best you can hope for is that like you can chop some of those lines but not all of them I, I don't like that's why i love the imagery of this and the more i talk about it like the more clear and and beautiful and tragic and, and horrifying all this imagery becomes mm-hmm. yeah yeah I, I, and i love the, the the character of the fisherman where you know it's interesting to draw that contrast with Stephen King where where I, I kind of feel like in a King story, the fisherman character or, or, you know, the equivalent of that character would be like sort of sort of just an antagonist. Whereas I, I think what's what's great here is he's just like our other characters where he's somebody who's whose family was taken from him, you know, in a horribly traumatic way. And he basically became a dark wizard and is like, I'm going to first I'm going to kill everybody in a horrible way. And then I'm going to dedicate the rest of my unnaturally long life to like overturning the cosmos to, to, you know, un- undo that wrong that was done to me. And, um, I think, I think, you know, all of our other, you know, widower characters can relate to this and, and feel some compassion at least, if not, if not agree with his choices, they can feel some resonance. I mean, certainly Dan, is willing to go, you know, more or less endorse the whole program of like, yeah, we're going to get the undead um, versions of these, of, of our family members and we're going to bring them back. That's, that's fine. Let's do it. Whatever you need. Um, and uh, yeah, it does, it does kind of seem like it might, you know, rupture reality and plunge us all into a infinite hell, but I, I get to have my, my family back. So, uh-huh. you know, little column a little column b (laughs) yeah no i I like that i I like that the fisherman you know as much as he is the antagonist of the novel um like the, the the none of the climax really centers around him specifically right like like he's just there tied to the rock tying himself to the rock so obsessed Mm -hmm. with this one thing that he's keeping himself there and just like reaching out and begging for people to come come help him come understand him reaching out you know, two, I think very specifically two widowers as well. The only other mm-hmm. people that could possibly understand what he's going through. Um, and, and so there, there's no final fight with him. Like none of, none of that happens. Um, you know, the mm-hmm. closest we get to that is, is the conclusion of the story within a story when he and, uh, and, and what is God? I cannot remember names. Why am I so bad with names? What is the, no. it starts with an R. What is his name? Renald. Yeah. Right. Reinhard, something like that. R when R fights yeah. him and they've got like spinny globes of energy. <laughs> I yeah. just, I, by the way, just love the magic. Like again, the magic of this is just like yeah, yeah there's just like glo- there's energy. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah. But and and then like the 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 kind of I think the brilliant contrast by by like making all of that stuff told from the perspective of the Jacob character, like the one the one person that. It, it, not the one person, but but one of the only people in the story that has not 
experienced that kind of loss, but mm-hmm. is like is is on the the beginning of that process of of he's falling in love with Lottie and he's gonna eventually marry her and like the, we only know the story because he tells it to her one day, and so he's kind of experiencing this stuff from the outside and almost is unable to understand it. Like it, it allows, it allows, I think the otherworldliness of this whole thing to be almost more otherworldly because like our point of view character in any of this cannot emotionally relate to anything that's happening there. Um, mm-hmm. Which I think is, is really clever, but yeah, I, I just, I, I find it incredibly powerful and, and, and kind of, I mean, it, it's, it's such a dark book, but it's, it's beautiful. And like the simplicity of the, the metaphor there like I, yeah. I think this book opens with a quote from moby dick the first line of the book is 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 aping off of yeah. moby dick call me call me, call me yeah. Abe, right? yeah and and it's basically yeah. signaling to you that this whole th- like don't think of this thing this big huge monster as a big huge monster it is a metaphor think of it as metaphor uh just mm-hmm. like just like our big white whale um you're, you're totally right although i spent almost the entire book thinking about it as a big monster <laughs> Um, I mean, I mean, you're, you're definitely like, I, I, I say that to to clarify, like I was really just enjoying this book as a fun yarn. Sure. Yes. It can absolutely be taken on the literary level. Um, the, uh, the Moby, the Moby Dick comparison is evident. The idea of grief as a giant black monster that just lies there in an infinite inky ocean underlying everything. Yes. All very metaphorical, but I also just loved it as kind of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, not what, what, what's the word for not metaphorical? <laughs> uh, literal. Literal. <laughs> as just as just literal. It's just a literal giant monster, uh, and it's creepy and scary, and I, and I love that. Well, I mean, that's that's mm. I mean, we talk about this, I think, every month, but like that's the fun of genre, right? Is that it can function in both ways, and it yeah, like, yeah. I, and and I think the thing I like about it, and, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot, because I've been thinking about the ways in which a, a lot of a lot of this this the genre stuff that I don't end up liking is genre stuff that feels like they came up with the thing they wanted to say, and then they built a story around that thing. And mm-hmm. actually we talked about this a little bit with, um, there was a horror movie ca- that came out last year. I know you didn't see it, but it was called smile. Um, it, it, we talked about this a little bit on the doof cast that this was a horror movie that is basically about, um, trauma and your ability to recover from trauma and the way that trauma infects you and infects everyone around you blah 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 i didn't really like the movie i thought especially the ending of it was super dumb but it felt to me like a movie that like the writers came up with this is a this is the thing i want to talk about first and then i'm gonna like build a story around it and i think the best genre stuff recognizes that your your primary focus the thing that you need to spend the most time hashing out and getting to work is the story the story is everything and the theming and, and, and the things that you want to say with the story, if you're doing a good job with that story will naturally come out and, and, you know, convey themselves. And I, I really feel like in a lot of what we're doing in, in storytelling these days, we don't do it that way. Um, mm-hmm. And that creates, in my opinion, subpar stories. And uh, the point of all this is I feel like this was obviously a story that was about grief, that was about, um, you know, the, the, the never ending nature of it. But it also feels like a story that like tacked that on to yeah, there's this giant Cthulhu monster. And also uh, fishing's cool, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it didn't um, shove itself into the into the center and and, and insist on itself too much. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah, no. I, I <laughs> every time someone says insists on itself, I yeah. hear the Family Guy thing. Yeah, I think I've done it like twice in the last week because I just <laughs> watched it the other day and I, I did not care for the Godfather. Yeah, it, it, it insists. It insists. Itself. What does that mean? What does it, that mean, Matt? So, you just said it. What does it mean? It's so funny. It it uh, yeah yeah you know you know what I mean you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> um, to distract entirely. Uh, uh, Heller mentioned a minute ago, the Helen character or the 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 revenant of of Helen rather, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where. I, I, and we gestured at this. We said, you know, the story within a story, but we didn't talk specifically about this. This is like maybe my favorite horror element of the whole thing is, you know, this guy, I guess he cheats on his wife and then his wife finds out 
kills herself. And then she and, and then he goes crazy because it's his fault. And he I guess he goes to the fisherman and he makes a deal and he brings her back and she's hor- horribly physically mangled, but still alive and saying creepy things. And her children are terrified of her. And like, they try to hide the children from her and she's like ripping her way into the house from oh behind and just all these amazing scenes of her, like making her way around the town while being all mangled up and yeah. s- saying things that terrify people. And I just love that whole bit yeah um, of the story no i totally agree it's great it's so creepy and and i like at the end of that like she's like just easily dispatched like mm-hmm. he just like says a thing at her and she turns into water and is done mm-hmm. um it, it, remarkable stuff I, I love i love the way langan writes about the way she talks and that like when she when she speaks to you in this language that no one understands you like see through the hearing right there's mm-hmm. this really interesting thing he does where like the, the the words transport you um and and, mm-hmm. and and basically allow you to see the ocean like it's it's just it's really creepy and mm-hmm. and uh like this is one of those things i actually think this book would make a pretty good movie and, and I, mm-hmm. I, we don't always talk about this but like there's sometimes you're reading something and you're like oh yeah you could adapt this you could adapt the hell out of this and you get a, like a really good director with like a good eye you could have a lot of fun with the visuals of this thing and you could mm-hmm. make it super creepy in like a really fun way yeah um, and i i think they should do that <laughs> i really do yeah yeah now i'm just imagining the sequence of her like trying to break into the house where they've hidden her children as just a set piece oh would my be God. yeah would, yeah would be amazing yeah so i i um you know, we've talked we've talked a lot about sort of the uh, mythos of this thing and, and what you just mentioned about the, the like she speaks her language, which sort of sounds like weird, creepy fish sounds. Um, and and it 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 hypnotizes people, but also it's it's almost like what's really happening or my interpretation anyway, was like the true nature of reality is that underlying everything, there's like this abyss of nothingness, which is like the ocean and 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 our reality is just sort of this you know oil slick on top of it basically that maintains its own reality but like at any moment if you make if if you you know live your life wrong or think the wrong thoughts or whatever you could fall through into this um into this abyss and so all she's doing when she's talking to you in her language is she's just reveal you know she's just parting the veil for you yeah um which I love that I, I, yet again, it, it speaks to this like deeply pessimistic, deeply horrifying view of the nature. <laughs> like it's the most genuinely Lovecraftian story I've read in a long time because mm-hmm. the nature of a Lovecraftian cosmos is like, oh, it's real bad. You're in a real <laughs> bad situation just by existing in the universe. Yeah, yeah. And l- if you're lucky, you can live your whole life in total ignorance of all of this because finding out the nature of it would just drive you mad. Yeah. And, and that, that is in essence what happens. Like, I, I don't know. What, what did you feel about the, I mean, obviously the, like the very end moment we both talked about how, how it's is great, but like the moments of, of Abe's life, like leading up to the end, I think is real just really fascinating stuff. Like he kind of slow rolls, like he starts moving through time. Um, the, the, the nine 11 stuff was interesting in that, like, I guess you just like, feel like you can't talk about talk about like a person moving through the 90s into the early 2000s without also talking about 9-11 because as you and I have talked about this is a thing that everyone that lived through that is still traumatized by in some way mm-hmm. um but like it kind of just like rolls through like like part of it part of it seems to me Langan like commenting on the 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 reduction in the veil between mm. our world and and the black ocean um and it's like yeah and these events happen and then this uh, and then we thought this we were going to be great i leave in the 90s and then nope nope and then like and then he mentions like and all through that the weather in the area just kept getting worse and worse and it gets more rainy and then the hundred year flood happens and it's just like it all just seems to be building um and meanwhile our character is just like living his life making friends with the neighbor's daughter and teaching her about fishing like i don't know it's just 
it was an interesting choice. To, like I was kind of surprised that we did this thing where we basically like hit fast forward on his life and just really accelerated through um, his life after this moment. I don't know. What'd you think about it? Well, for one thing, I, I was honestly confused about the nine 11 stuff. I actually had the thought. I was like, I guess this book must've come out in like 2002 or something. <laughs> no. And, and, and he is just like reacting to this thing that happened recently. And it's like, nope, Kent came out in 2016. It, it, he, he very intentionally decided to talk about nine 11. And then, and then the best I can do in terms of explaining it is it's like, it's this shared event of grief yeah. rather than a personal event of grief. Oh, that's true. Where, yeah. You know, you just, you just said we were all traumatized by it and that's, True, but I think an equally correct word is that we we all are, are are you know grieving it in the same sense that you grieve a loss, even even if you didn't lose any person that you know individually. It, it was a it was a national tragedy that we all grieved and um, well, processed. It, it, not yeah. not even the specific grief of like the loss of life there, but but also it representing like a grief of a loss of perception in mm -hmm. what the world is like yeah. i think was was a lot of what 9 11 was for a lot of people um mm -hmm. was that that we thought things worked a certain way we thought in this new in this new millennium this is this is what this is what this is the way it was and then this was a real a real tearing down of that understanding for a lot of people um mm -hmm. so yeah like yeah i, I like i like what let the just like the, the the loss of a spouse is such acute specific grief right and it is kind of maybe opening this up to more more broad um less specific versions of of that same feeling yeah i like that yeah yeah so that 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 makes sense and i i like how what you what you said a second ago about how it being an indication of like the world getting worse yeah. um ties in with with the 911 thing and, and mm -hmm. also just with the ending overall where it is it is far from a, a happy ending. It's basically like, yeah, not only did they not, you know, defeat the fishermen, but like the, um, you know, infestation of of this demonic presence or whatever you want to call it has has broken the banks, literally broken the banks of of Fisherman's Creek, mm -hmm. and is now washing up on his doorstep, literally. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's only getting worse from there. And you know, he's barely able to to fight it off with um. Uh, you know, a gimmick, basically, not not some kind of like holy weapon that that actually counts for anything. Um, I thought it was you know, it was very like dark and and like bitterly cynical. The idea that the 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 being that comes for him in his own house is Dan, right? Mm -hmm. um, or or the you know the shade of Dan or or the twisted simulacrum of Dan or whatever you know. However, this works exactly the the evil soul of Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst parts of Dan. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's just so, um, depressing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and I guess my question to, to hop onto the depressing train is like, does this book say there's anything you can do about it? Like, like there is, I think a different version of the story would be like, you know, inspecting and examining the ways in which the different men deal with their grief and talk about, you know, well, these, these, this is the way Dan did it. And that's the bad way. That way does not result in you being able to, but like, I think one of the interesting things about it is it seems like, especially as we move into the end that Abe is handling his grief, you know, fairly well, right. He's, mm -hmm. he's, he's moving past it like this. These, I love that part where he's talking about, you know, that you, you can't do anything at the beginning. Like Marie is so, tied to her death that talking about her at all is too much uh, connected to her death so he just mm. can't do that at all and then over time he's able to separate the death of her from the life of her and and talk about her life i thought that was beautiful and, and touching um and so it, it does show him starting to get the, the the symbol of being able to fish again is him you know being able to move past that grief and that and that event and 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 possibly live beyond it and then I think the ending of the book is like, no, <laughs> like even if you're doing the best version of what, what surviving uh, a spouse is or, or surviving this grief is, even if you're doing that best version of it, that ocean is just right there and it's coming. And actually the waters, the waters are rising and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just like, man, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think you're wrong. I, I definitely... 
I, I don't quite know what to make of it exactly because it did, you, you're totally right that it did seem like he was, um, you know, processing it all in a healthy way and making your friends with the neighbor and everything. Um, but, but maybe not, right? Cause he, he kind of was avoiding fishing all this time when fishing had been this thing that brought him solace. And I kind of see that as being an, another way of like a, avoiding dealing with something. Sure. Um, I wasn't yeah. sure. I never quite finished untangling that particular element of things. Um, I think one, one idea that I had, or I, I think one thing that seems pretty straightforward at least was like the nature of Dan and, and Abe's losses was actually quite different in a way that actually mattered because Abe could, you know, he could feel sorry for himself. He could miss his wife. He could feel like this is horribly unfair and, and all of these things and, and no one would begrudge him that, but but Dan had the extra wrinkle of feeling like it was his fault. Yeah. Um, and, and so he had all of that. Plus, man, if only I had just like done one different thing that morning and then he yeah. would go stare at the traffic lights. And, you know, when he's telling the story about going to stare at the traffic lights, part of you is like, you know, pro probably sort of through the proxy of, of, of Abe as a character is thinking like, man, you shouldn't do that to yourself. But it's like, okay, but you, you can say that because you didn't have any hand in your wife's death. Right. You very, you know, s structurally, storytelling wise, you you had nothing to do with her death. She she had cancer. It was totally unrelated to you. Yeah. It was just a bolt from the blue, basically. And um and so I think that it's not just an extraneous detail. I guess is what I'm saying. It it actually matters how the two men lost their their spout their their families. Um. No, oh. that's a, that's a really good point, and I think you know the 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 fault of the blame as as a part of that guilt, and also I think the book mentions the time, right? Like Abe knew her death was coming. This was a thing that she she mm -hmm. was fighting and battling this cancer for a long time, and he had time before she went to at least partially somewhat deal with that grief, and and you can never you can never fully right, um, but the difference in, in, in getting that time he talks about versus what happened to Dan, which is, it was immediate. It was sudden. There was no, there was no time. There was no plan. And, and I think also the added wrinkle, like the two children as well, like losing your spouse awful, but also mm -hmm. losing your two children, yeah. like on top of that, just, just yeah. insurmountable. Just, yeah. just losing everything about how you thought your life was going to go yeah. yeah, in a way that feels like you're never going to come back from it. At least that's, that's the vibe I got. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the, so that that all connects in. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess the question there though is like, I agree with you. Like, obviously, this is a story about you know like the different the ways in which these different kind of griefs affect us, and, and and Dan the choice Dan makes is different from the choice that Abe makes, and part of the reason for that difference in the choice is the things that they that happened to them were unique from each other. But the, but it does feel like we're all back at the same place at the end anyway. Like we're all standing there looking down into the, into the black ocean and seeing the corpses of, of the ones we've lost and noticing that the water is slowly rising, you know, like mm -hmm. it, 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 even if we come at this from different, different places with different experiences and, and different struggles and some struggles harder than the other, it all, it's all, it's, it's one big ocean and it's one yeah. big old monster in that ocean. So, so let me sketch something that I just thought of, so I'm not too sure of it, but um, take it as metaphor and, and you say uh, uh, Abe is sort of telling himself and telling us this story of, yeah, you know, and then I processed the grief and I moved on with my life. Um, and and we, just, we just outlined this whole thing where it's like, well, you know, Dan just lost more than Abe did. And I even just now said, you know, Everything was taken from Dan in a way that it's not quite the same as what happened to Abe. But then Abe looks in the water and he sees not only his dead wife, but he sees the two children that he could have had mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. never did. And you and I think what that's on the metaphorical level, what that says is he's grieving not only his wife, he's grieving the whole life that he could have lived. Yeah. And he can, and he may tell himself, oh, I, I can talk about Marie and, and just appreciate the good things. And I don't think that's true. And I think that's the, I think that's what the two children being there means other than being just the most delightful horror stinger ever. <laughs> I think that's what the two, the two children mean. Um, cause it definitely feels 
important that it's two children, just like Dan's two children. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I f- first of all, I love that. Like, I think that's it's exactly that's exactly what's going on here, and and I think that's beautiful and, and awful <laughs> at the same time. And I think that does like just the this the stupid like plot examiner in me when i saw the two children that like and this pisses me off that i do this sometimes but one of the first things was like wait are they twins or because they only did it the one time and i just uh-huh. need to like tell that part of my brain just be like shh, shh shut up this is not I, you're missing you're missing it yeah. <laughs> stop I, it i think they must i think they probably were twins weren't uh and uh just like dan's twins right yeah so that's an so. even more direct um mirroring of the two mm-hmm. of them Sure, sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that explains it, but also it, it allows it to represent on a much more metaphorical level of, yes, this is, this is, because th- I think that's what happens when you lose a loved one. Like, you're not just losing that person, you're losing everything that, that your life would have been with them um, mm-hmm. from, from that point on. Uh, yeah. Maybe they never would have had kids, but that, that potential is well, gone now. Um, and that's what haunts him is the yeah. idea that, that that's what he could have had. Yeah. 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 Fuck. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go wake up my wife and tell yeah. her I love her now. Just wake up all the kids, just bring them all together. Big big family group hug. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's uh, that's 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 the service of fiction is it mm-hmm. makes us makes us think about this stuff. It's... Yeah, and especially like the fickleness, of, like the just, you know, the, 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 the refrain. I, I love the traffic. We haven't much talked about the traffic light stuff, but I, I love mm. it. I, I love like this this thing where this like oh there's a traffic light there now mm-hmm. do you know that and he's like yeah yeah you told me that before and mm-hmm. just like yeah the result of this this horrible horrible absolutely tragic loss of life is something so mundane and like oh well that was a, that was a flaw in our system let's we'll just patch that over and put a traffic light here now mm-hmm. you know that's like it, it makes sense right it of mm-hmm. course that would be that would be the result of what would happen and, and that's what the system attempts to do but like it's just like it, those, those are people. Each one of those lights is a person, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I found I found that image so powerful, and I think this is where the writing. I, th- I think I don't. We never talked about this, but I've never read a John Langan book. I don't know if if you had. Uh, this is my first I don't think time so. as author. So, the the language of when he's having Dan talk about the traffic light, and then and then I think, like, the the book, the book that his that's his uh, his grandfather's like fishing book right and it it says it's like you know when when the book was red it looked a certain way and when it was green it was it wasn't until it was yellow that it looked normal like i just the 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 specificity of that kind of imagery i think with the whole traffic light thing just really really touched me yeah yeah me too well i I liked just overall i mean you you mentioned that and it reminds me of how you know abe's narration feels so folksy and colloquial Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when Dan speaks, he has this whole other way of, of speaking and presenting things. Yeah. And then when we go into the story within a story, there's like a whole nother tone. So that's just a, a really, you know, strong flex of an author to be yeah. like, yeah, we're just going to casually change total, you know, the, the authorial voice um, in an utterly convincing way. Yeah. Um, would you read another book by this author? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I would For too. Sure. Uh, he has a novel called House of Windows. I think it was his first novel. Um Obviously, just copied House of Leaves. Act. Totally. Um. <laughs> yeah, that's first, my first thought. So, so there was one element that I, you know, we, we like for everything to fit together. It doesn't have to. There's no rule that says it does. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking about the fact that, like, IBM features a, a weird amount in this book. <laughs> and, and the idea that the company is, like, becoming more inhuman. <laughs> It's funny, that was almost a Freudian slip because I was going to say like dehumanizing their workers and then I said becoming more inhuman and I was like, well, maybe that's the, maybe that's what we're doing is like everything else in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, IBM is sort of deteriorating um, where, where it used to be this this like this business that took care of its employees and everybody yeah. felt like a family and now it's um, this, this you know, corporate place that just grinds people up and it, back in the day, you know, Abe got leeway when his wife died, but, but nowadays Dan can't expect that same level of leeway because yeah. there, you know, there's the, the bottom line to consider. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't, I kind of almost 
put some things together while I was talking just now, but I, I, did, I didn't really knew what, didn't know what to do with that element um, while reading. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're, I think you're onto something there. I, I, I do really like that. I mean, it is, it is kind of horribly tragic in a way that like, you know, the workplace, the, 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 I guess if we want to tie it into what we're talking about, like the grief of a, 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 a workplace and a profession in which you take care of each other. And, and we could, we could compare IBM to uh, the, the, the stonemason, the work camp and how these people were a community. They were like, how did, how did they defeat the fisherman the first time? Uh, he called up a bunch of buddies and they all mm-hmm. went and did it together. Yep. Uh, yeah. One of them died. So maybe this is a bad example, but, um, <laughs> but like just, just this idea of like, they, they dealt with these things together when something happened to one person in the community, the community rallied around each other. And like, we spend so much time, m- the majority of our life working with these, with these people. And it is, it is just, it's just not that anymore. It's just not. And there is something lost there. And there's some grieving about a, a, a way of life where, you know, you, you worked for a company your entire career and they took care of you and you helped them. And like, it was, it was this real symbiotic relationship where you felt pride and ownership of part of that. And that's just not there anymore. Yeah. And so I, I, I do think that is something that we're doing for sure. Yeah, no, I, I love that. The, the paralleling of, IBM with the town, um, mm-hmm. you know, that, that, that works perfectly because there is no real sense of, of the town that Abe lives in other than his existence as an employee of the company. So yeah, yeah that works really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to jump on what Heller just pointed out in the chat. The, the quote, uh, uh, from because I had this thought while reading and it just occurred to me, when the light turned the page red, the letters were darker, almost blurred at the edges. When it clunked over to green, the words were lighter, harder to see. Only when the light switched to yellow did the words return to normal. Saw Eva. What does yellow light mean? Caution. Caution. Warning. <laughs> Slow down. Yeah. Uh-huh. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Oh, uh, great book, man. Very depressing. Very depressing. I, I, I can come right out and say, like, I don't have this worldview. I mean, I, I think, first of all, it's easy for me to say I don't have this worldview when I have never experienced this kind of grief and, and God willing, will not have to. Um, but but I, I, I don't think I, I live my life this pessimistically. But that doesn't mean I don't enjoy reading about it and, and being put into that mindset briefly for a few hundred pages of a book. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Like I, I felt like, um, hundred percent agree with what you said. Like the book managed to be so fun while being so dark that I didn't mind it mm-hmm. being dark, mm-hmm. you know, cause there's, if a book is, if a book is just dark, then I'm just going to be like, ugh, you know, but I never, I never really felt that with this book. I was having so much fun, even though it's undeniable uh, that it is, you know, dark. I, I loved it. I loved it. It really keeps enjoyed pulling it. you through it. It keeps pulling you through it, like it's mm-hmm. uh, got a lure that's just trying to trying to pull you along. Yep. Yeah. Pulls you flopping onto the shoreline <laughs> with with that last line. <laughs> Guts you. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, great book. Um, anything else you wanted to say about it? No, no. Um, surprised. I'd never heard of it. You know, never heard of the book, and so I'm really glad that everybody made us read it. Yeah, and and again, it was just really an offhand tweet from Stephen King, I think. And I might mm. even be misremembering. It might be a tweet from someone else that I'm just mm. attributing to Stephen King. Um, but no, I, I really enjoyed it as well. Uh, I, I like, you know, it, it's not that I need books to be short. Like, we, we read plenty of long books. But, like, I think this this functioned, this length functioned perfectly for what it was doing, I thought. Yeah. Like, it, it didn't overstay its welcome. 250 pages or something, few a hour, few hours of reading. Like, it was perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agree. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and lock the poll for next month in just a few seconds. So if you if you haven't voted, if you came in a little late, Matt, would you go ahead and uh, drop that link in again? Just scroll up and copy I and paste it in. Will. Just so if the people showed up a little bit late and, and wanted the link again. Um, so, yeah, we're going to lock this down here in just a little bit. I, I will say as we prep to, to close down the show um, – well, I, I don't know, Matt. What do you what do you feel about this? That the 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 final the final Friday of December is the 29th, which is kind of smack dab in between our two big holidays. Uh, Christmas is the 25th, which is a Monday, and then uh, New Year's is the first, which is also a Monday. Do we want to 
try to do the show on the 29th or do we want to just push it off to the, the next week? I think I'll probably have family in town that weekend. So I think we should probably push it off. Okay. That makes sense to me. So we're going to push it off a week. So the next month's episode will technically take place in January, just like the November episode here took place in December. So it will be the 5th of January. We'll be meeting once again. And the book that we will be discussing is let's do it here. I'm going to refresh just a couple more times all right <laughs> it is interesting that the book with the most amount of votes in this straw poll is the one that got the least amount of votes on patreon it's fascinating it is really fascinating isn't it um i accidentally deleted something where is that all right so up oh, it happened matt I, I i had a feeling i had a feeling it was gonna happen uh-huh if we got a tie again <laughs> oh my god so once again we have a tie and once again the tie is between star wars heir to the empire uh which tied with uh the fisherman last last week and we ended up picking the fisherman um this time it's it's <laughs> tied with the ferryman so Another uh, water-related uh, story. Um, so th The Ferryman is a Justin Cronin book that I, I saw was nominated. It just came out this year, by the way. Um, I read his uh, The Passage series uh, a few years ago and, and enjoyed it and was curious about this new book. So when I saw it on there, I put it on there. I, I, you get a say in this, Matt, so you know, f feel free to interrupt me if you disagree. But I think the fact that Star Wars Heir to the Empire has tied two months in a row now, like I don't think we can... Unless we really, really don't want to read it, I don't think we can push it off again. I think we have to give it the W this time around. I think that's reasonable. That's that's the uh, uh, generous interpretation of what a vote should should mean. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's that's going to be it. I, I refreshed one more time just to see. Um, but so I, I think we're going to do the Star Wars book. I, All I, right. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. I was hesitant to put this on the list. I think you've read it before, right? Um, I read it when I was like literally a preteen. So yeah, yeah. Well, I I don't remember. I mean, I, it's funny. I, I actually think I remember what happens pretty well, but I don't <laughs> think I like really knew how to read back then. So <laughs> this was nominated right when the Ahsoka television show was just starting because I think it it relates to that. Um, I think this is one of the few uh, expanded universe things that disney like brought forth into the modern canon um so i don't know it'll be interesting like i've i've to be honest i've never read a star wars book ever wait i think i read shadows of the empire so i think that's that's the only one mm -hmm. um and just as i say that heller says the same thing that's perfect uh yeah so i, I this is this is going to be a new experience for me we'll see if i like it or not i i'm going to here, here's what i'll pledge i will i will try to go into this with as open mind as possible because I, I am I am I feel myself being pessimistic about the odds of me liking this book, and I don't like being that person. Um, yeah, I I mean, in case you need a little pep talk, there, there's a reason why it influenced so much of the later expanded universe stuff. I, I think sure. I, I think it's I think it's good storytelling. It's fun storytelling. It's very much the direction that I wish that the EU had kept going in. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, again, this you're sort of referencing okay. the memories of a of a 13 year old, but I, <laughs> I remember enjoying it. So okay, cool. Well, uh, that that has helped a little bit, so I appreciate that. So, so yeah, we'll check it out next month. Uh, we will be concluding 2023 with the Star Wars novel, um, just as it's announced that Filoni will be taking over the Star Wars universe. And I think we're both pretty mixed on that. Maybe we'll have yep. a conversation about that at the end of the episode. Somehow Filoni returned. <laughs> Uh, all right, folks. Thank you so much. This was this was very fun. Um, surprisingly fun, considering how dour and depressing the book is. Uh, <laughs> but thank you, everyone, yeah. who turned tuned in live and, and chatted along with us. Uh, for those listening on the audio after the fact, uh, really try to come hang out with us next time. It'll be the 5th of, of January. We'll be reading a Star Wars book. It's a great time to come chat about why, um, why Ahsoka is bad and Andor is good. <laughs> yeah. I think that'll be a great conversation as well which is our favorite thing to talk about yeah, yeah and of course yeah. you get that extra vote if you do yeah definitely 
And if you like what we do here at Doof Media and you want to see more of it, then please head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia and consider donating to support our organization. At any available level on Patreon, you'll get access to the ability to vote for books uh, for the book club, um, as well as a bunch of other exclusive features. Um, by the way, this week we launched our merch store yeah. at uh, doofmedia.myspotify.com. Uh, uh, no, you keep doing that. I keep doing that. <laughs> doofmedia.myshopify.com. Sorry. Shopify is not a merchant. Um, doofmedia.myshopify.com. If you're, if you're interested in repping the book club. Yeah. Um, lots of cool stuff there. I think we do have a couple book club things. I think we made a Sanderson joke with one of them, which I, I find absolutely delightful. Yes, um, we did, <laughs> but, uh, there's a bunch of other stuff there. It's, it's really cool. Really exciting. We've been talking about doing that forever, forever, forever. And we finally got it done. Uh, props to Matt for facilitating that happening. Um, well, thank you. I have to thank our, our, our friend, uh, uh Jody, um, yeah, for no, she, helping she as well. Was, absolutely instrumental in that as well so yep. uh yeah check out the store order some merch i wish i had stuff to show you but you know we, this happened so fast that the stuff that i ordered before we made it live hasn't even showed up in my, my door yet uh but uh we'll have it next month to show off so uh buy buy things yes it's good please <laughs> stave off your grief with a mug a mug or a t-shirt <laughs> All right, folks, uh, if you have any questions or comments or just want to reach out, you can always find us on Twitter, X, whatever, at Doof Media, or email us at doofmedia at gmail.com. You can always find us over at our subreddit and, and on Instagram. You know, we're on all the socials, and it's at Doof Media on pretty much every single one of them. So you can find us there, and uh, and we hope you do. Um, this is it. We're done. Have a good have a good rest of your weekend, everyone. Have a good month. We'll see you in 2024, which will be the the fifth, the sixth year of the book club? Dear God, we've read oh so many books. We have, Jesus. How have we not read all the books yet? I, it feels like we must be more than halfway there. <laughs> uh, we'll see you next month. We'll see you next year. Have a good one, everyone. See you later. All right, we out. All right.